talking to women about women's empowerment is something that is very close to my heart. I think looking at countries like Sri Lanka and even looking at the world today, we have many, many, many challenges. And every day we watch, we read the chaos that is present. And it's certainly uncertain times. But I think as women, what can we do? Personally, I believe, I believe that women, we wield enormous power, but it's very understated. We are the mothers, we are the daughters, we are the wives, we are the girlfriends of presidents, of, we are <laughs> of corporate leaders, policy makers, even terrorists, rebel fighters. We have their ear. But do we use this ear? I think that's the big question. Um, in Sri Lanka, we constitute over 50% of the population. Today, we are the backbone of the economy. Whether it's our migrant workers, which the country claims is the number one foreign exchange earner, whether we are the garment workers, we claim that's the second most important economic activity in the country that contributes to the economy. Whether we are the workers in the tea plantations, which is perhaps the third. So I think when we look at that, we are a very, very integral and almost, I would say, the backbone of Sri Lankan's economy. Now, I think that says a lot because we are crucial. We Sri Lankan women, women all over the world, we are a very, very crucial part of the world's population. But do we make an impact in our society across the board? What role did we play in the reconciliation of our nation after a terrible 30-year war? What role do we play in the governance in this country? How many of us corporate women have made it to the board of public enterprises? So I'm going to take a few key topics today from my perspective as a woman who works in business, um, how I see things and how I think that we as women can play a more effective role. Let's look at women in peace building. One thing I have learned throughout my life is we can make a difference. The important thing is to have the passion, the drive, and push your beliefs for the greater good. Over the years, I have been an activist on many social causes that I have felt, felt very passionate about. So while I have championed the role of business in peace building and post-conflict reconstruction, one of the most significant beliefs I have, and I still believe, is the role that women can play in reconciliation and post-conflict reconstruction. As a country, we suffered the consequences of a 30-year war. It has forever, forever changed the social fabric of this country. Today, while we have peace, we have to keep investing on a sustainable reconciliation process that will secure our nation and all our people for the future. I think one of the most inspiring and successful post-conflict reconciliation process that was in history was what happened in Rwanda. The leadership recognized that to have true reconciliation and a sustainable peace post-conflict development, that women were key to this process. It was the women who suffered the most in the Rwandan conflict during the terrible war. As a personal friend of Jeanette Kadami, who is the wife of the president, I have learned much about their success story, and I have to tell you, it's absolutely inspiring. And I'm sure many of you are familiar, but it is, there's nothing like it anywhere in the world. The first thing they did was they rewrote their constitution to ensure that women were given a strong place in their parliamentary system. In every electorate, they had to have three, they had three candidates. And that meant one woman, one youth, and one any other. 
This changed the whole dynamic in their governance system. Today, Rwanda has over 60% of women in parliament. Now, that is an amazing achievement. As a result, and I think a big part of it, is that today, Rwanda is the fastest growing economy in Africa. It is stable, investment is coming in, and it is considered a model of success. So what is the success of this model? And I think one of the greatest strengths of this is the ability for those women to forgive and move forward. I think forgiveness was a big part of the role of women in the success of Rwanda. Despite all they suffered, they were able to see the futility of war, especially because they were the most victimized of the war. So when I served as a consultant to the UNDP, we had a program then uh, in the early 2000s called Peace, Invest in Peace, where we had the opportunity to work with the regional chambers across the country to look at post-conflict development in Sri Lanka. And I really saw the need for women to play a greater role in helping to build a united Sri Lanka. And I think that role is still with us. We still don't have the sustainable solution in our hearts. We may have it on agreements, we may have it as we speak, but do we really have it in our hearts? I saw the need for women to play and playing still a greater role in building a united Sri Lanka. At the end of the day, as women, irrespective of our race or religion, we face the same challenges. And this commonality is what should bind us together to work for the greater good. Because we are women, we have the same problems wherever in the world we are. We are the custodians in our homes. We create the environment our families grew up in, especially our children. What we say gets embedded in their minds, and many carry those prejudices with them all their lives. It gets perpetuated from generation to generation. It is up to us to speak unifying messages in our home. It is up, us, up to us to treat our sons and daughters equally. It is up to us to encourage our daughters to believe that they too can have careers and be entrepreneurs and reach for the stars. As a member of the Women Waging Peace Network, I have been championing the role that women can play in their community that will have positive outcomes for gender equality. I've spoken at many forums on this issue and it is also very close to my heart. See, I believe I really do believe in women's empowerment. I believe as women, we are natural born managers. We are multitaskers. We manage our homes, our families, and our careers. I think the challenge now is how do we transform women from just being managers to being leaders? Now, I also work with the Commonwealth Business Women's Network where we are working to promote women's empowerment in the Commonwealth countries. There are two billion women, and some of the poorest of the poor among them. And I think working in the field of communications really gives me a certain skill set, which I think has helped me to understand the problems and see how we can better communicate the type of messaging that we need. OK, so let's look at women women in the workforce. On gender equality, Sri Lanka significantly dropped from its 2012 position of being 20, 39th place to 55th place in 2013. This was a further fall from 31st place in 2011 and a further fall from the 16th place in 2010. So can you imagine, in 2010 we were number 16. By 2013 we had dropped to 39. Well, let me tell you, that's not so bad. It's much worse today. Today, our gender ranking, according to the World Economic Forum, we have dropped to 100. Now, this tells us a sad story of where we are currently as a liberal nation, 
on gender, we are going backwards. Research has shown that countries have not removed barriers to that countries that have not removed barriers to women's participation in the workforce do not see returns on their investment in the development of one half of their human capital. Countries like Sri Lanka, which boasts a high literacy rate, over 90%, where we see girls excelling in their academic achievements, the question we have to ask ourselves is how many of them continue on to contribute to the workforce? The reality is we have an untapped but highly educated talent pool and the country have much to gain by enabling these young women to participate in the workforce. In fact, studies have been done that show closing the gap between male and female employment could boost the country's GDP by double digit. By restricting job opportunities, it could unknowingly be costing Sri Lankan billions of rupees. When I say restricting, is not facilitating it adequately, not taking into consideration the challenges that women face. In a country that is post-conflict reconstruction and reconciliation, women can really play a pivotal role in helping to rebuild the economy, especially areas that directly come under the con came under the conflict. We still have an estimated 40,000 war widows in the north, and I'm sure there are thousands more in the south. And this is an important group that instead of being a burden to the state or to their community, depending on handouts, to become economically empowered through entrepreneurial programs so that with skills training, access to finance, they can be very constructively contributing to the workforce and the country's development, apart from being financially independent. There is growing evidence that the impact of increasing gender equality will see the rise of the middle class and women's spending priorities will also rise in terms of household saving. There will be a shifting of spending patterns, all of which will stimulate the economy from food to fashion to education to financial services and childcare. So as stated by the Economic World Forum study, there is a strong correlation between a country's gender gap and its national competitiveness, income and development. A country's competitiveness depends on its human talent, education, skills, and productivity of its workforce because women account for one half of a country's talent. A nation's competitiveness in the long term depends on how it utilizes and educates its women. And this is the story we need to take to our governments and our policymakers. They have such a wealth sitting with them that they are not really tapping, they are not really understanding, they are not framing policy to make that human capital become gainfully and economically empowered. It is important that in a country like Sri Lanka, a new era of development is required that maximizes our potential, and we must strive for gender equality to ensure the same rights, responsibilities, and opportunities as Sri Lankan men. It is up to us to influence policymakers, business, employers, and civil society to incorporate equality into their practices and policies. Um, as a working with the Commonwealth Business Women's Group, one of the three areas that we were focusing on was encouraging more women to take more senior management positions in the corporate world. So here I'm wearing my corporate hat. We are aiming to develop an international pipeline of female targets for national and international positions on these companies because I was very surprised when I did an evaluation of Sri Lanka's top 25 public quoted companies, I was surprised to note that not even 10 of them had women on the board. And how many? One per board. So what does that mean? It's token, a token one. Not because they recognized us, possibly, but just to be able to say, you know what, we have a woman on the board but that's not good enough. So, the surprising thing is that many of these companies manufacture products and services especially for women, but strangely do not have women on the board. I mean, now this is ironical too. So while we complain about the lack of women's participation in politics, which we do a lot in Sri Lanka, 
because we have less than 4% women in politics, in government. The reality it is as bad or worse in top management in the corporate world of Sri Lanka. So what does it take for a woman to succeed in this environment? <coughs> Remember, because we're women, we're always more under scrutiny. I mean, have you noticed lately, Theresa May, I mean, they're always talking about the shoes she wears and the clothes she wears. I mean, they never did that about David Cameron, right? Did they ever talk about his shoes and his tie and his clothes? But because it's a woman, they're always looking at her. Oh my God, today she's wearing Versace heels. Okay, so that's the kind of difference, you know, that we, we are always in the limelight. We're more at the butt end of criticism. People look at us more than they would look if you were just a man. Anyway, so in that environment, let's see. I believe we have to be passionate about what we do. We should never settle for the minimum. Personally, I never take no for an answer. I will persevere till I get the result I want. I think as women, we are um, biggest drivers. I know I drive myself. And we need to set high standards for ourselves, and we should not rest till we achieve our goals. I strive for perfection. Sometimes it's tough because you know, you put so much pressure on yourself and you're juggling all these balls in the air, being the mother, the daughter, the, you know, the employer or employee in this case. But in the end, I believe it pays off. Especially when you're in a leadership position, it's important to lead by example. One important lesson that I have learned is always working with a team. And I think that is something that we women can do well, be team players. Because alone, we cannot do many things, but together, there's a lot we can achieve. In a corporate context, I don't know that I see myself, if I've achieved anything, is because I'm a woman. No, rather, I think I see myself in the context of being an individual. I set goals for myself, I work to achieve them, but I do believe that being a woman gives me a different dimension in how I approach things. I think we women are just wired differently. And on the flip side, it can also make it more challenging. And I think this is what we bring to companies, corporations, is that different thinking. We just have a softer approach. We just do see things differently. Personally, I like to get involved in social causes. My company, Dentsu Grant, we do a lot of public service advertising. I really believe that if we have the network and the ability, it is our job to communicate the right messages. Um, I mean, my recent, I think by, um, I think by being involved in these areas of social causes, you know, it keeps us connected, it keeps us involved. And I think as women, we should strive to be activists. We need to be activists because we can make a difference. And if we take up causes that affect us and we know that's going to affect our children, I think we don't lose anything. But by silent, being silent, by complaining, by not acting, then we are also part of that. My recent activism was in working together with a passionate group of people. And here again, I'm just using this example that as women, we have the ability to draw on people. You know, it's just something I think that it's a gift that we have that we can get people to gravitate towards us. And we have, I mean, this was a really good example where we got a group of people to come together, to take a look at this whole issue of energy in the country. We were trying to promote another coal plant in Sri Lanka. We were concerned with the terrible pollution that results in coal plant. We had seen the results of one coal plant already in an area called Norachole. It's a disaster. The local community are sick. The coral reefs are being bleached. There's less fish in the ocean because they're pumping hot water. The way they store the coal ash is unacceptable by any environmental standards. 
we were not going to let that be repeated. But what was really great is that myself, and I don't know, some of you might know Otara, Gunawardana, and a group of lawyers, women lawyers from EFL, and of course a great group of male colleagues, we got together and we worked actively for this because we believed that for our children, we didn't want them to inherit a country that had, I mean, there were actually, the plan was nine coal plants in Sri Lanka, nine for a small country because we were going to export it to across the water. So we were going to bring the coal in, because we don't have any natural resources, we're going to bring the coal in, we're going to generate the power, keep the pollution, and export the power back. Tell me, that's not such a good idea, especially when today the whole world is moving away to renewable energy, and we have sunlight and wind for free, so yes, there's a cost of setting it up, but thereafter, there's no more supply chain, it's for free. But I have to say that the approach we did, the way we worked on it, the ability to pull people together, was an, it was um, amazing, absolutely amazing. When, when we started out, people said, you're crazy. How are you ever going to stop this? But if we have a belief, we have a vision, and we work together, and we're passionate about it, I think we can achieve wonderful things. In the end, you know, from the president to the prime minister downwards, they heard us. The fact that we had signed the Paris Climate Agreement was very important that we were able to stop it. So, I think it's possible. And that's the lesson that I have been learning through my life. So let's talk about work-life balance. That's always an issue with women. And I think this is something that many of us have managed to find ways to manage. But oftentimes, I've had very talented women, managers, senior people, with great career prospects who decide to give it up and stay at home to look after their children. Now, I understand that it's a difficult challenge, as the onus of rearing children still falls on the women in the household. Oftentimes, our in-laws, family can put pressure on us, and other times, there's no support services available to take care of young children. Even me, you know, I always felt guilty that I worked long hours, that it was at the expense of the time I spent with my two daughters. But I think, as women, to get a balance, we can work within parameters. We need to set those parameters. And there are very creative ways that we can make the time we spend with our kids really good quality times, do some things, like weekends were always dedicated to them, I mean, I always went home to do their homework, put them to bed, read them bedtime stories, but I often fell asleep before they did on the bed because I was so tired and that was, they thought, so funny. When I went overseas, I used to always leave them a note every day that I was gone with something that I said how much I love them and how much I miss them. And they would open a letter every day that I'm gone. So there are things that we can do to make them feel loved and not, you know, that our jobs have taken us away from them. And I think what is important is that personally, I never saw myself as a stay-home mom. And I do encourage women who work for me not to give up when they have a family. Because I believe women have a huge role to play in the workforce, to be empowered, to grow. Today, a single family income is not sufficient to provide for your family needs. And I think increasingly men are beginning to adjust to this dual role that women have to play. In my case, my husband has been very supportive, and I think the family support system is really important, and I'm really blessed for that, and I don't know how many women have that support system, but I really do hope they do. So even if I tell my women who leave, I said, even if you cannot do an office job, women can have startups from their home that enables them to have a second life. See, I strongly advocate that women need to have their own independent source of income and feel economically empowered rather than be a dependent. I think this is so important. Whatever it is, I think women need to be financially independent, have something of their own. And I think the learning for my children as a working mother 
is that it's normal, it's okay to be a working mother. You know, we're not in any way deficient as a mother. And I think they have grown up believing this. Today, they are both working women, and I'm proud of it. In fact, they were my greatest advocates, my biggest advocates of being a woman entrepreneur. They have always encouraged me, telling me how proud they are that I'm a working mom. And I'm sure like every one of you, family means everything to us. And I learn from my daughters, because they see things from a fresh perspective, and I really value that. We have a mutual respect for each other. The lovely aspect of relationship is we are close friends. We have even started projects together. I believe in encouraging my daughters to be entrepreneurs. I've invested in empowering them to help them to pursue their aspirations and goals, whether it's staying within the business or outside. So I think we need to do the same with all our daughters. Not to say that we don't do it for our sons, but then the sons naturally feel that they are the ones who are going to be the people who work and earn. But having this parallel stream is really important. So I think someone might say, so what drives you, you know? What makes you do this? I think it's just myself. I drive myself crazy, actually. <laughs> but I do have a very strong personal drive. And that gives me the energy to keep going. I keep challenging myself every day. But I also believe it's the spiritual aspect that gives me strength every day to cope with the challenges that I face. I start my day thanking God for the many blessings in my life. I believe that how to live your life is written for us, and we need to follow those teachings. And there are four simple precepts that one needs to follow and live by, and I try to do that, although sometimes it's not always easy. But the one that resonates always for me, and it you know, crosses all faiths, is treating people the way you want to be treated. I think that's a very, very fundamental point for me, and I think for many of us, the world would be a much better place if we could do that. From a business perspective, I'm embarking on a major growth strategy. I don't know how to stop working. I love the challenge of doing more things. So with the advent of technology and new communications platforms as a company, we are also transforming to embrace these changes. And yes, we have the challenges of social media, which our previous speakers spoke about. How do we manage this in the context of women, gender? It's a, it's a mess. It's a huge problem. Uh, but I think women are also party to it because we put ourselves out there. We look sexy and we want to look beautiful, you know? And we, we, we do draw ourselves in without realizing it, not meaningfully, I think. But it's a, become a very narcissistic society that we live in today. It's all about me and selfies and projecting this life that we think we're leading, which is probably not a real life, but it's a life we want to project to others, you know, how cool we are, how wonderful we look, what a wonderful life we're leading. It's a problem. You know, we are living in a virtual world now, and that's a challenge. How do we get this balance going? But I think it requires creative thinking on all our parts as women, because we live this every day. We live it through ourselves, through our daughters, our sisters. We see the challenges. And I think it also gives us huge opportunities. You know, we should never feel, I think when we have a problem, I always see an opportunity. It's, and we can always find solutions for every problem. And it's how we set about it and the intent that we have in developing that. So, I think change is a good thing. We need to look at things with fresh eyes. Maybe we need to change the stereotyping that we have selves brought on us. You know, I think we have to look at that. And we have to see how we can do things better. I think the challenge is all of, to all of us. And I think we continue to learn every single day. I think um, as women, we do have our challenges. Um, it's not an easy life because we are trying to do many things. 
But I think, I think hard work, determination, passions are the cornerstones that should drive us. Because we, for women, we want to succeed. We want to be able to juggle all these things and make sure that everything is working, you know, all the moving parts are working well. And I think that the only person who can limit us is ourselves. We can limit ourselves. And I don't think that's what we should be doing. We should never think or confine ourselves to saying, you know, this is all we can do. So in closing, my message to all of you today, as women, we have a very important role to play in our nation's future. And today, we have the ability to speak without fear. We need to be activists in the areas that we believe so that we can make a difference rather than be silent by standards and do little to change things, whether it's clean energy, women's empowerment, unifying our nation through collective efforts, preventing violence against women and children, protecting our environment, working for rural communities to educate them on better ways of doing things, protecting our oceans, the list goes on. We need to pick an area that we are passionate about in our community and get involved. Remember, every drop creates a ripple. And we are never too insignificant to feel that we cannot make a difference. We can. Thank you.